Hi, and welcome back for the sixth lecture in EE 375. In this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, some of the principles underlying data visualization. And like many of the uh, best practices for data management and data wrangling that we've talked about in some of the previous lectures, um, most of the principles of data visualization are ones that often seem obvious once you've hear, heard them. Uh, but the fact that most visuals violate these principles suggests that they actually are not obvious unless you stop to, to think about them. And like other best practices, the goal here is to learn from the mistakes of others. Uh, so this figure here, uh, which shows a, a four-page memo, uh, comes from a take-home I assigned one year in 375 before I taught visualization explicitly. Uh, the assignment was to produce a two-page memo uh, comparing high, medium, and low scenarios uh, for an invasive species at three different locations. If you look closely, you can see those three different locations indicated by three different colors uh, on these figures and that the high, medium, and low scenarios are represented on three different figures, uh, which is very uh, representative of, of the figures that were turned in. And indeed, uh, when, when I gave this assignment, everyone was successful in being able to model these different scenarios. Uh, but remarkably, almost everyone forgot how to count to the number two and turned in a memo that had three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages, uh, which is not you know, useful if you are working in a job and have been you know, asked to give a short memo to your, your boss or to send up to some other superiors. And you know, they're looking for a nice, concise document. Um, so the, the, the reason that the, the, this memo ended up so bloated uh, was in large part due to how the scenarios were visualized and how they were reported. Um, and in, what really was happening was that people were uh, visualizing the results and discussing them in the order that they did the simulations that generated the output. So they, they, you know, they ran the default run, they ran the uh, best case scenario, they ran the worst case scenario. And, um, and so we ended up with three visuals for those different scenario, sets of scenarios that were run. And uh, you know, often you'd have the three scenarios discussed after the, each figure, um, which kind of resulted in the fact that now if I want to compare the high, medium, and low scenario, which is, if we stop to think about it, probably the thing that your manager wants to be able to do, um, not only is that information on different figures, but it's literally on different pages. So it's you know, virtually impossible to see you know, how much worse is the worst case versus the best case. Um, Furthermore, you know, you're taking up space with a lot of figures that are, are in many ways, uh, you know, you, you uh, yeah, they're, they're somewhat redundant and, and just taking up extra space. Um, and then the, like I said, the, the writing followed that pattern as well. And instead of say, you know, if you wanted to know about the mean and, and the comps interval, you would you literally would have a paragraph describing the mean on one page, you know, the, the paragraph describing the upper comps interval on the next page and the paragraph describing the third, the lower comps interval on the third page. And like I said, this not doing this way seems obvious in hindsight, but the fact that a whole class did it proved it was not obvious at the time that we were doing it. So let's dive into uh, what are kind of the principles around how, to, you know, how you might visualize a problem like this better. Um, so first one that I think is uh, important is the goal of a visualization is not to prove that you did the work, uh, which is, you know, I think in many ways the mindset that a lot of folks have uh, when they're in college or, or earlier in, in high school, uh, when you know a lot of what you're being asked to do is to demonstrate that you did your work, um, and you know the, the mindset in many lab reports that many of us have turned in over our lives is all the information isn't there somewhere; it's your job to find it. Um, you know, the students in this class are now all. Uh, you know, in their upper level of their undergraduate careers and about to head out on the job market. And that's not the mindset that works uh, if you're working at a real job. You know, you, you don't tell your boss all the information there somewhere, good luck finding it. Um, it's really time to kind of uh, 
move beyond kind of the brain dump mentality to raising our games to think about how is information actually going to be used and how to convey that information effectively. So the first principle is really the design has to be done with the user in mind. What is the user going to do with the results? Why am I producing this information for them? How are they going to interpret this? And that, you know, beyond that, the, you know, the same information could be visualized very differently depending on audience. So, you know, if I'm trying to visualize information for a scientific publication, I might visualize that differently than I might do in a report for decision makers. And I might do that differently if I'm doing this for a live presentation with an audience uh, that has to, you know, there might be people in the back row and that puts a real emphasis on, you know, making figure labels and legends particularly large and bold so that folks can see them from far away. Likewise, you know, a, a decision maker is probably going to linger over a visualization much less uh, than you would in a scientific publication. So if we think about uh, making visualizations, we need to have something in mind to help us judge when one visualization is effective or what makes a visualization effective. And I would argue that one graph is more effective than another if it's quantitative information can be decoded more quickly or, and more easily by most observers. So the goal here is you know, to not make someone linger over your visualization, to make the message you're trying to get across uh, clear and, and convey that as, intent, as concisely as possible. And so you know, part of this is not just knowing your audience, but also really knowing your message. So having the time, taking the time uh, to do you know, many, maybe some, you know, a lot of initial preliminary visualizations that might be you know, quick, dirty, low quality to kind of get a feel for the data. But once you understand the story that you're trying to convey, to really kind of optimize your visualization around what is the thing you're actually trying to convey to your viewer? So here's another example uh, that are showing some uh, growth curves for populations growing at different growth rates. And the question of interest here uh, was how the populations varied in their doubling time. And we've actually marked that with a dot, so that you know that does help. Um, but you know, one thing you'll, a couple things you'll notice. Well, one thing you might notice is the visualizations look fairly similar. You know, we've got these growth curves. They look a little bit different from each other, uh, but they don't look wildly different. And, and one of the reasons they don't look wildly different is that the, the y-axis is actually changing uh, from figure to figure in a way that's actually pretty misleading. Uh, so you're, you're not really conveying information effectively because we're not seeing, you know, that the, the, the high population growth rate isn't just growing isn't just like steeper, but it's growing, you know, orders of magnitude faster uh, than the, the lower population growth rates. Um, second, you'll note that if I'm trying to compare these double in times across populations, that takes time and mental energy uh, because we put that information in different panels. And so if, if the things I want people to understand and make comparisons of uh, are, are in different panels, that's going to slow us. I mean, it's not that it's impossible, but it's going to be inaccurate. And it's going to be slow. If I want people to compare things accurately, I want to put those uh, pieces of information together. So here's showing how, you know, dropping lines to do those comparisons. But here's what we get kind of to begin with. Let's, let's put the things we want to compare on the same figure. Um, and now we have far fewer figures. Uh, dropped from four to one, and this would, you know, kind of work with that initial lab that I was talking about, uh, you know, where you had different figures on different pages. Let's put all this information on the same figure. Uh, let's just note that the information we're interested in is actually crammed into one corner of that figure. And I want to point out that uh, just because we have data or model output that covers a full time range uh, in a, a wide range of, of Y values, uh, doesn't mean that we have to show that full range of data. I, I want to note here that what I'm saying is actually very different from saying it's okay to cherry pick your data, which you should never do. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're trying to design our visualizations uh, to focus in on the question. Uh, so we're not trying to hide information. You should definitely kind of do the exploratory analyses to understand the full range of variability. 
uh, but we were designing our, our visualization to answer a specific question. And that the answer to that question is just in this narrow portion of the figure. So let's kind of then zoom in and focus here. So now we have a visual that's much better at answering the question at hand. Uh, we can kind of easily see uh, the, the relative differences between these populations and their growth rates. For, you know, uh, I, that said, uh, this is a starting point. This visualization is now kind of uh, got things organized in a, in a useful way. And in some of the later videos in this series, we'll address how to improve this further to make it even more clear, crisp, and professional. Uh, one great example would be to always look at your, you know, first of all, always make sure your axes are labeled when that information is needed. Um, and second is to, to look at what your figures look like when they're scaled down or where you're standing far away from them uh, to make sure the axis labels are appropriately sized. You know, again, coming back to that example, you know, if this figure is being pro you know, projected on a, pro on a screen for an audience and someone is you know, way in the back row, they might not be able to read any of these figures, or you know, if it looks great this size when it's scaled down into a publication where this is, you know, just you know half column width, uh, you know, the the legends may become the figure may become illeg illeg illegible. Cool. So some kind of take home messages from the first bit of of principles here is, you know, again, the, the focus on sparing your reader from having to do mental gymnastics. So you know you're designing it for their sake, you want to make things clear for them. It's the, the user is the, the audience here. Um, choosing your scales with intention and being mindful of axes when displaying related information, both horizontally and vertically, to allow comparisons. That doesn't mean, so I'm not saying that multi-panel figures aren't, uh, aren't appropriate, but you should definitely be thinking carefully about how uh, those axes are set up to align comparisons. So, if you want comparisons across figures, you need you know, the same X and Y axes. Uh, you need to line things up well. Uh, a, a last point I want to bring up here is, is to not fear white, white space. You know, there's an initial temptation to fill charts with a lot of things, fill them with you know, a lot of labels and a lot of you know, grid lines and a lot of color and you know, animation and 3D and all this stuff that makes figures complicated. Uh, but doesn't necessarily make them better and doesn't actually necessarily make them clearer. So, you know, an important message in this, you know, one of the kind of pioneers in visualization, Edward Tufte, has these kind of two principles that I think are really important. Um, displays should have a high data to ink ratio, which basically means if there's, you know, think of it, if you're printing it out, uh, if there's ink being put on the page that isn't conveying data, it's not really serving a purpose. Uh, and related to that, we should avoid what, what Tufty calls chart junk. So uh, useless, non-informative, or information obscuring elements uh, within our displays. So again, that would be things like unnecessary 3D. I mean, there's times and places where you need to visualize 3D objects in 3D, but you know, unnecessary 3D, unnecessary, you know, you know crazy fonts or, or uh, extra lines. And, and actually, I'm going to show briefly here, an animation that kind of goes through for a simple uh, chart how to uh, simplify things and how to improve that data to ink ratio and showing that uh, removing things from a figure that use ink but don't convey information can improve that figure and make it easier to understand. So here we're dropping backgrounds, dropping redundant labels, um, removing unnecessary borders, yeah, reducing our colors to focus on the group we're interested in, removing special effects, removing unnecessary bolding, lightening on labels that aren't really the key thing to focus on, lightening lines or just dropping them completely if they're not the things that we need to focus on. Uh, here showing an example of directly labeling the bars we're interested in rather than relying on axis labels. And we end up with a figure um, that in the end, um, is, is much more effect, effect, effective. Okay, so this about wraps up kind of the intro portion of this lecture. Uh, in the remaining uh, bits, I'm going to go through four shorter videos uh, that's going to rely on, again, on some of the information from uh, 
plus Wilkie's Fundamentals of Data Visualization book. We're going to talk about uh, the principles of proportional ink, how to handle overlapping data points, dive into uh, how to handle and use color uh, effectively, and how we can use uh, redundant coding uh, to, to you know, convey, uh, basically to clarify figures. Cool. Hope you pick up from there.